Welcome to Bitcoins and Gravy, episode number 79. At the time of this recording, Bitcoins are trading at $425 each. And listeners, before we get started with the show, I'd like to share with you a website I recently discovered that will help keep you up to date with live streaming crypto cryptocurrency prices. Check out CryptoCompare.com. This is the best resource I've found for looking at trends and for gaining valuable information about digital currencies, mining equipment, and wallets. Bookmark it now. CryptoCompare.com. Mm, mm, mm. Now that's gravy. <laughs> Welcome to Bitcoins and Gravy, and thanks for joining me as I podcast from Nashville, Tennessee, the Bitcoin center of the South. I'm here each week with my trusty dog, Maxwell, right by my side. Say hello, Maxwell. (laughs) We're two Bitcoin fanatics who love talking with people about Bitcoin and sharing what we learn with you, the listener. Longtime listeners, thank you once again for supporting the show with your tips. And new listeners, we hope you enjoy the show. On today's show, I am privileged to be speaking with Chris Coney all the way over and across the Atlantic Ocean in the UK. Chris Coney is known as the Marketing Monk. Chris teaches an online course called Digital Money Revolution that can be found by going to digitalmoneyrevolution.com. This course is the best way to get you up to speed on the exciting new world of cryptocurrencies. Welcome to the dawn of the age of cryptocurrencies. Listeners, today on the show, I am thrilled to welcome as my guest, Chris Coney. Chris is known as the Marketing Monk, a nickname that he has become known for because of his two vocations, marketing and meditation. Chris is the creator of Marketing Mandala, a conscious marketing framework that teaches a more natural and ethical approach to growing a business. Chris, welcome to Bitcoins and Gravy. Thank you very much, John. It's an absolute pleasure. Now, where are you? You're in the UK somewhere? Yes, I'm on the east coast of the UK. Um, It's in a county called Lincolnshire, which is a farming community. And the city that I live in is called Grimsby. Grimsby. You know, it's still my dream to travel to Great Britain someday, and I've never been there, gosh darn it. Wow. Well, I've never been to Nashville, so I'd love to come there. Well, you're welcome to any time, man. So let's see. I loved what I read there, that you provide a more natural and ethical approach to growing a business. You know, in this day and age, um, I think we're having problems worldwide uh, with ethics and morality. Yes. Where it looks like greed is at the helm of every ship, and uh, sometimes, Mm. you know, people will let these ships sink or let them run into icebergs or whatever without any care or concern (laughs) as long as they make their profit. So it's, it's refreshing to hear that. That is exactly it, mate. You're talking about the short termism where, you know, the next quarter's profit is like the only thing that matters. Hmm. I mean, try and live your life like that. That's just a terrible way to live. Not just the business strategy. If you only live and think about your health every quarter, you're not going to last long. Hmm. That's a good point. I'll read something else that you sent over, if you don't mind. This is uh, talks about your personal mission statement. It says, his personal mission statement reads, to lead people to freedom. This statement signifies his commitment to experimenting with his own life and finding ways to enable greater freedoms so he can then share these freedoms with his friends, families, and followers. I like it a lot. So, Chris, you teach an online Bitcoin course Tell us if you would, first of all, how you got involved in Bitcoin and then how you decided to start teaching a Bitcoin course. I came to it quite late, I would say. It was probably 2014. So, yeah, that was that was quite late in terms of Bitcoin. Um, 
and I guess it just started to it's, it's like one one of those things that it sort of I saw a bit of it and then I heard about it again and again and then there were these big gaps in between hearing about it mm-hmm. and of course every time it came back to me I thought oh that looks interesting mm-hmm. kind of forgot about it and eventually as I built up these little pieces of information about what it was eventually there was a tipping point where I was like I need to take a look at this mm-hmm. in more depth mm-hmm. so that's when I started my research in earnest and of course then the deeper you go the deeper you go right mm-hmm. and you're, you're down the rabbit hole and for me it was i i think bitcoin was made for me for someone like me because the thing that i've been fascinated with is i've just self-studied economics even though i'm not qualified in it even though you know i don't um use it as part well i do use it as part of my profession i guess as a business person mm-hmm. I like to understand markets and things like that i've always um liked technology since being a a kid um what else does it bring together it brings begins together sort of computer programming the internet all that sort of stuff just suddenly came together in one place Hmm. right and it couldn't have been a better fit for all of the things i was interested in not only that as a if you want to call me a freedom fighter if you like Mm -hmm. uh, i just i just saw it i just saw it because i'd studied economics historically and i saw the tyranny around um around money and how there was the point in history where money and politics all got sort of confused hmm. even though they originally weren't related at all yeah m- currency emerged from the people as a way of trading it had nothing to do with politics or anything else it was purely a means of exchange mm-hmm. and i think i think people in the modern world actually don't have that awareness they just sort of it's always been this way because it's been this way longer than a single lifetime so unless you pass that knowledge down from a one generation to another wisdom let's call it then it just never gets it just gets lost right mm-hmm. and if you don't pass down knowledge from one generation to the next you're doomed to repeat the same mistakes yeah wow yeah i completely agree and that's what we're doing these days it seems like we're, we're repeating the same mistakes not just generation after generation but just almost continually now elsewhere also but in america you think in four year terms you know four year or eight year terms in terms of who's in office and how much you're going to argue with your friends about politics or not and um mm. yeah we we don't have any we don't really think in terms of separating money from government from taxation or anything like that we don't really for the most part none of us really thinks about it from childhood till the day we die we all worry about money and we all want more and need more money to do what we need to do and to survive but we really don't even think about like wow why am i being taxed so much and could the taxes go up and why do the taxes go up and why do property taxes go up even though my property's been paid for for years in the case of seniors, they may have had their house paid for for 20, 30 years, and their property taxes go up so high that they have to sell. They can no longer afford to live in the house that they supposedly own. But we don't even think about why this is happening. So, yeah, I think a course like yours where you talk about some of these things is appropriate. So please feel free to talk about your online course, Marketing Mandala, um, as much as you would like. Okay, sure. I've always been a, a big thinker, like watching the news as a kid and going, something's wrong with that. And constantly asking the question like, what's causing this? What's causing that? Why, 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 right? Mm -hmm. And of course, as I got older and I developed the vocabulary to express myself and things like that, gained more knowledge, I was able to actually think about this deeper and deeper. And every time I tackle some worldly issue like terrorism or poverty in the third world or even poverty in our home countries, I'm always asking like, what what's the cause right this is a we live in a dualistic universe there's there's two sides to everything black and white you know man and woman up and down do you know what i mean all that everything is defined by an opposite of some kind Mm -hmm. so if there's an effect that we look at there has to be a cause there has to be in order for that effect to even exist in the first place and back to what you were saying about this greed and this short termism things like the health industry and economics and most of most of the stuff we do to try and solve problems we're not trying to solve them all we're doing is constantly inventing new remedies to placate the symptom whether that's a new aspirin or a new drug we're always pushing against the problem trying to push back push it back push it back whereas of course every time we try to push back against something it'll just you know it'll just come back twice as hard Mm -hmm. because force generally negates you know it's like newton for every action there's an equal or an opposite reaction Mm -hmm. so one of my core beliefs is you force negates 
you can't, you know, if you, if you have to force it, it's not going to work. So that's like pushing back against the effect. So I'm like, okay, we can't address the problem from that end. We have to go to the other end. What's the cause? Because if you remove the cause, the effect vanishes automatically. So where I'm going with this is as I was analyzing the world's issues, finally, I made a mental breakthrough um, as to what the cause of, I'm going to say boldly, all of the world's problems is. Because mm -hmm. I was looking for what's the thing that, that's, that's the pattern underlying all of them. And what I came down to was awareness of the individual. And when I say awareness, I mean a more mainstream word for that would be like, say, education. Let's just say terrorism or something like that. Someone who has been brainwashed into a, sing a singular belief system. Of course, we're not born with those kinds of beliefs. We're taught and we're conditioned to see the world in a certain way, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that's, and I'm not singling out any particular religion or anything like that, anyone who's indoctrinated, whether that's into a corporate way of thinking or whether that's into a religious way of thinking or whatever, that model of the world was taught to them. And it's as if the world is that way. Mm -hmm. And the only way to recondition or to expand that view of the world is education. That's the thing I kept constantly coming back to. Why is there poverty? Why is there this? Why is there that? Why is the other? Mm -hmm. I always came back to a lack of education of the individual. Hmm. And not naming any names, but if you look around the world, there's sort of a battle of oppression. And when you want to oppress people, you just keep them dumb. Yeah. Because that limits their awareness and it limits their ability to think for themselves. Yep. I knew that I had to commit myself to educating people. Hmm. This is the other thing I realized as well. Every one of us, we all know we want to get out of life, whether it's make more money or whatever the hell it is. Mm -hmm. And everyone at this very moment in time is doing the very best they can to achieve that. Okay. So whatever they've learned, they're using the best strategies they have available. And when I say have available, I mean in their heads. Mm -hmm. So they must have learned those strategies somewhere. Now, if those strategies aren't getting them what they want, it means they need better strategies. So that's back to education. Yeah. If they were taught better strategies, if you suddenly become aware of a way of doing something that's got a higher chance of you getting what you want, you will automatically switch to it. Automatically, right? Automatically. Mm -hmm. So if we all want to be happy, healthy, wealthy, we're all pursuing those goals and all of us using whatever strategies we think are best. Okay. And then we're constantly looking for better strategies all the time that can get us there quicker, make us more wealthy, healthier, whatever it is. And the only barrier to that in my mind is education because all those strategies are out there. They must be because there are healthy, happy, and wealthy people in the world. Mm -hmm. So they sort of know how to do it, right? They must know. Yeah. So that information exists. And if it doesn't exist, someone's going to create it eventually. So that's sort of where I've made it my mission, um, leading people to freedom. It's like freedom of thought, freedom of emotion, and all that kind of thing. The, the question of how is a thing that really frustrates people. They know what they want, and they know why they want it. The thing that bugs people is like, just tell me how and I will do it, mm -hmm. right? So the how is the education thing. So going back to, um, I'm going to use terrorism again. Sure. So why are people behaving in that way? Well, because wh whatever they're doing, suicide bombers, whatever it is, they honestly believe that's the best strategy available to them to get them what they want. And if it's martyrdom, right, that, that's, that's a very narrow way of thinking. There are other ways to feel positive emotion, which is ultimately what they're going for. They want to feel good. They want to get into heaven, whatever the hell it is. Mm -hmm. But it's an expectation that they will feel a certain way. Now, are there other ways of reaching that emotional state? Well, of course, right? Are there other strategies that will lead them to that emotional state without having to kill themselves and other people? Of course. How do I know that? There are millions of people who right. have that positive state that don't blow themselves up. <laughs> right. Okay. So what's the problem? Lack of education. And people who are conditioned to be suicide bombers, they have a very, very limited set of education on purpose because human beings are not stupid, right? They're not stupid. We've got these brains, which are powerful, powerful computers, you know, powerful machines that 
will solve problems if just given the raw material. And that raw material yeah. is information. I like it. Yeah, you know, when you think about public education, at least here in the United States, which is what I'm familiar with, and I know it's similar elsewhere, you're taught, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and, you know, some American history we're taught, and it's usually just repeating, you know, George Washington and the cherry tree, Abraham Lincoln walked 10 miles to pay somebody back a dime that he owed them. You know, here's what happened at the battle of this and the battle of that. But we really don't get a well-rounded education in any area here in the United States, for the most part, in our public school system. And certainly we're not taught to think outside of how the system thinks so that, you know, my niece comes home and she tells me we're learning about slavery in school. And she's referring to the American slavery that, you know, most people think has ended. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked her, I said, well, what about, are you studying anything about slavery that's going on currently? And she said, well, what do you mean? There isn't slavery. I said, well, yeah, there's slavery all over the world. And then she and I talked about it. And I think that she understood, wow, there's a lot that we are not being taught. <laughs> in school to say the least so you know by omission we are really putting our children in a deficit situation starting out but it's not only by omission if it was only by omission you know you could supplement that with certain things but the sad thing is that public education in the united states is pointedly toward getting kids to think in a certain way and to think in a certain box and to live in that paradigm and not step outside of that lest you be considered, you know, some kind of radical. And, you know, talking to my nieces and nephews and young people that I know, and, you know, adults too, there's this huge fear of terrorism mm. uh, now. And the sad thing is that from my research, I happen to know for a fact that many of these, in quote, terrorist events that happen in the world, including 9-11, are in fact false flag events. In other words, they are created by people to propel their agenda forward, sometimes in a rapid way. So is everything we're hearing in the news, this terrorist attack happened here, here's who was caught, here's who they were, here's why they did it, and now we're going to have to take away some more of your freedoms. We're going to have to walk around town with tanks and search the houses. We're going to have to level of curfew or what have you we don't know what's coming i think we're going to be i think some people who listen to what i just said right there and think he's a conspiracy theorist i say no no i do not talk conspiracy theories i speak only conspiracy facts and i'm well aware of who the conspirators are but i think that people are going to be shocked in five or ten years to see how many more of our freedoms are going to be taken away through taxation through robbing of public funds and pensions and whatnot, bank accounts. I think people are really gonna be shocked at what they see as governments begin to kind of fall apart because they've tied themselves so closely to the control of money as opposed to letting in the United States and in the West, as opposed to letting free market capitalism or free market economics, you know, rule the day. And, and they certainly don't right now. So in educating people, Chris, let me ask you, why is it that Bitcoin comes into play? Obviously, you could be educating people about how to be more mindful in this way, how to meditate, and that will, of course, allow your mind to work better. You'll be more successful at whatever business you're doing. If you practice some form of meditation each day and get rid of all the noise, you'll be able to see things with clarity a little bit better. As the Dalai Lama said, I heard him speak at IU, Indiana University years ago. He said, if you have a problem, step away from the problem. And when you do, you'll realize the problem is not as big as you thought it was. You'll have some distance from it. You'll be able to gain perspective of that problem. But Chris, why is it that you are incorporating Bitcoin and interested in Bitcoin when it comes to teaching people? Okay. So I'm going to combine that with what you just said about the Dalai Lama. So he says to okay. step away from the problem to gain perspective. And mm -hmm. you were also talking about the education system and the paradigm the existing paradigm, and we're not encouraged to think outside of it. Well, that makes perfect sense because the solution never comes from within the existing system because oftentimes that threatens the existing system's existence. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. So the trouble is, how can you 
step away from the problem of uh, economic tyranny if there's no way out. So hmm. our economy in the fiat world is a closed system. You can't get out, right? You, you can change it from one fiat hmm. currency to another, but if you imagine the fiat currency as a circle, everyone's inside it because there was no alternative until there was. Then came along mm -hmm. cryptocurrency. That's a new circle that bumps right up against the first one. That's never ever mm -hmm. existed before in the history of humankind. And now there is mm -hmm. a little doorway where those two circles meet. And the first Bitcoin transaction for that pizza for 10,000 Bitcoins was the first person to step out of that big fiat circle into the new one. That closed system now had an opening. Right on them, imagine the two circles side by side, you know, one against the other. Fiat circle on the left, mm -hmm. little tiny cryptocurrency circle on the right. So the economy is tiny by comparison. It's like the earth and the sun, you know, by comparison. Mm -hmm. But over time, every time a dollar is moved or spent or a piece of value is exchanged for a Bitcoin, an extra person jumps into that circle on the right. The fiat circle gets a tiny bit smaller. The cryptocurrency circle gets a tiny bit bigger. And over time, you're going to end up with this sort of figure of eight, where both circles are roughly the same size, where the cryptocurrency world and hmm. the fiat currency world are competing. Never has a currency had to compete. And I'm not talking about the British pound versus the US dollar. I'm talking about the category of fiat currency and that whole system is closed meaning you're imprisoned in it and there is no choice. You know, awareness, mm. education, whatever. You can understand economics out of the yin yang, but you can't get out of it because there was, there was no way out. There was no alternative. So then when Bitcoin right. came along, it, we now have a choice. There's now fiat has to compete to survive. I like the image that you're creating in my mind of the two circles. I like that. And of course, you know, in some ways, early communication, models showed two different circles. There's this person communicating over here and this person communicating over here. And they show the two circles as separate in more modern interpretations, models of communication. They show those two circles interacting. And then of course, you'd have to add to that another circle over there, which would be about half the size of the big fiat currency circle. And that would have to be barter and all of the underground, under the table trading that goes on in the world, which is a massive part of the economy. It's the part that allows people to be free in the marketplace without being encumbered by fiat currencies or gold or silver and that, you know, that is trade. Okay. But uh, anyway, please continue. I love everything you're saying. Sure. And no, I like what you just, that was the perfect uh, segue there when you said about barter, right? So what we're doing is, is just exchanging value. So you talk about people trading mm -hmm. with each other via barter and there's no delay in that process. That's something fundamental to economics is the concept of friction. The lowest friction transaction is where you've got what I want, I've got what you want, we're stood next to each other at the very time that we want to exchange that exact thing, right? Zero, zero mm -hmm. friction transaction. You can find the guy right. and the thing, boom, transaction done, right? Now that's okay, but as society evolved and society got more complex and actually Back to what we were saying earlier on, the reason we don't question taxation and all this kind of thing is because the complexity of the world has got to a point where it's so complex, it's just overwhelming to even think about tackling it. But I'll come to that later. So mm -hmm. friction is the key thing. Um, and really, that's one of the fundamental benefits that crypto promises and couldn't really, couldn't really have happened until now because we never had the internet which is a frictionless communication system so mm -hmm. we sort of had digital currencies in terms of digital numbers on a screen for your bank account if you do online banking so it's sort of digital currency anyway um because cash you know is used less and less and less so it's a digital currency but if you can print it it's not scarce so that's re that's a real problem but even there's friction in there in terms of a transaction fees friction the delay to send money to someone in several days is a friction and it just slows down the economic progress of things. Mm -hmm. So if someone has an idea, someone has a, you know, a eureka moment and thinks I've got a solution to one of the world's problems, right? Then the rate at which they can act on or bring that solution into the world 
depends on the friction in the economy, right? How quickly can you can you deploy that idea and get it done? Yeah. Um, and the more, and it's not just one little bit of friction between you and I. That's multiplied by 7.2 billion people, all trying to transact on a daily basis. Um, and of course, with the internet, you can the probability of finding someone who has what you want goes up massively when it's it's not just one to one anymore. It's one to seven billion. Right. And we see that in crowdfunding, of course, where if you're a small business trying to get your product or your idea off the ground, well, maybe you'd have to go to a bank and the bank would say no. You'd go to another bank for a little loan. They'd say no. These right. days, <laughs> you know, it's usually mostly no's unless, you know, you've really got something going for you in terms of assets or, you know, something else that you're willing to put up there as collateral. So now with crowdfunding, yeah, you know, I don't have to wait. I don't have to sit around waiting and wondering, did I fill that application outright are they going to say yes or no and it takes weeks and months and sometimes years i can see right now if i do things right and uh, if the product is good and if you know people are receptive i can all of a sudden see i'm getting funded right now immediately so yeah i agree with what you say about friction that uh, we're we're moving toward something that has much less friction and of course ultimately uh, the move to peer to peer and uh, decentralized is really the ultimate goal Friction is also the cousin of efficiency. Um, so Bitcoin incredibly efficient. You know, it's it's it, frictionless transactions and all that kind of thing. Um, so you, and back to your idea there. So you want to start a business. You want funding for it. So what's the strategy right? to get funding? You go to a bank and then the bank has a hmm. strategy. What do they want to do? Minimize risk. And their strategies are give me some collateral. Let me look at your business plan. Let me look at how the world works right now, and then I will I will assess, me, the bank manager, what the hell do I know? Um, I'm going to assess whether I believe that <laughs> business plan and you and everything has a high chance of success. Okay, that's fine. That's a strategy that has served us quite well over the last, say, 100 years. Well, so and what's the goal? It's to get that new innovative idea to the marketplace and, and see if it will work mm -hmm. and, and make it successful and, and so on. Bring that value. Okay, so then Kickstarter comes along crowdfunding um, brings a whole new strategy to the table. Well, I tell you what, instead of having one individual or a team of bankers sort of try and assess whether this thing's going to be successful and what is success, well, will people buy it? Will they consume it? Will it be valuable to them? Well, why not just go straight there? Why not just go straight to the market and say, hey, guys, do you want to fund this up front? Yeah. Right? Put your money where your mouth is. If you would buy this product, stick the money down now and then we'll make it for you, and then we'll send you it, okay? So same outcome, different strategy, much more efficient, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And if the evolution of mankind was our, every human being's highest priority, then that would just be able to roll out without any friction. But of course, the reason that doesn't happen is because you've got the incumbent banking system that sort of doesn't really want innovation because it's kind of easy life right now. It's easy going, you know, there's, they're fat, dumb, and happy, as I call it. Yeah, man, when we think about how many things in the history of the world have been held back or have been squelched by, you know, some fat cat somewhere <laughs> in a bank who's made the decision, I just don't think your business model is going to fly. You know, if we think about how many people are held back by a board of directors at a school, you know, a school board deciding that we're going to do this instead of that and the funding that is held back by people when the funding needs to be there from the state or from wherever how much has been held back by the people who are acting as gatekeepers right and acting as custodians and always they're acting they're playing the role of you know a big brother or a parent who they say we're trying to help you we're trying to make sure that this works out well for you. We're trying to make sure you're safe. That's why we have to fill out all of these forms and that's why we have to take so long with this and that's why sometimes nothing ever gets done because we can't be hasty, right? We have to make sure that everything's gonna be safe for you. You know, we know the truth. We know what the rub is, as they say. But yeah, this movement toward peer-to-peer -to -peer is really the most exciting thing going on. My fear is how artificial intelligence might come in and throw a wrench in our machine as we move toward peer-to-peer. -to -peer. Um, artificial intelligence could end up doing some weird things that would hurt our movement. But let's not digress toward artificial intelligence, please. I want you to continue on. Sure, sure. So you were talking about the board of directors there, right? So 
you know, or, or someone who is assessing the loan application and they say, well, you know, I'm, I'm considering approving this funding. And the reason there are these hoops to jump through is we, you know, we have a process We're we're assessing the risk. We're trying to help you um, avoid making a mistake. OK, now that's fine. And that's the, that's basically them stating their intention. And a lot of people say intention is everything. Well, I don't I don't buy it because if anyone's read that book of mice and men, right? Yeah. Like George, the big like <laughs> Lenny, the, Lenny's the big dude, right? <laughs> yeah. And he actually, he, so he breaks the woman's neck, right? That was the consequence. What was his intention though? His intention was to stroke her hair. What What did he actually do? He killed her. So intention is not everything. Ah, I didn't mean to, George. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead, man. He didn't mean to. <laughs> he didn't mean right? to, yeah. Mean to means that wasn't my intention. Well, I don't care whether it was your intention or not, you killed somebody. Yeah. So intention is not everything, okay? Yeah. Awareness is everything. Because what he wasn't aware of was the fragility of her neck and the strength of his arm. Yeah. Because if he had have been aware of that, he wouldn't have squeezed so tight. Yeah. Because he didn't intend to kill her. So intention and awareness, he would have got the result he wanted, which was to let her know, stroke her hair, felt it, it was nice. She'd have thought, okay, fine, you know, just stroke my hair, thanks very much, it's great. And he should have been alive. Okay, so <laughs> yeah. intention plus yeah. plus awareness. So yeah, and again, that that's because that comes back to that thing I was talking about. Awareness is everything. You know, awareness of um, what's going to happen, what are the possible consequences. Back to the school board. Okay, so there's that's an individual, a team. Their intention is to help you. What if they're not equipped? What if they don't have the requisite awareness, experience, or education mm. to assess it? And actually, check this out no individual has we've got a very limited range of you know sensory apparatus i can only reach so far i can only sense so much with my skin i can only see so far i can only see certain light waves in my visual spectrum i can only hear so far mm -hmm. and that kind of thing mm -hmm. i can only process so much information in the human brain so expecting an individual to make a decision like that and trying to calculate all the complexities of the economy to figure out whether it's going to succeed or not, that's just a that's a definite fail. Yeah, and that's where we see in the Bitcoin world um, these innovative things like Bitcoin Hive Mind, where we're going to leverage the wisdom of the crowd, where thousands and thousands of individuals will use their eyes and their ears and their knowledge mm. to collectively come together and assess things from five thousand points of view to see what they all think as a collective will happen, and now that's going to be a million times more accurate than any individual board or, or someone assessing it. This is sort of a very long answer to a question that you asked me right at the beginning was, you know, why, why did I create a course on Bitcoin? So why is because of this history of mine where I'd built up this deep conviction that information and education is the key to changing the world. Mm -hmm. Because with enough information and the right information, then each individual will have the knowledge and the strategies to go more quickly, more directly to what they want, which is getting whatever it is they want out of life. This episode of Bitcoins and Gravy is brought to you by our good friends at MoonshineBootWax.com. Made by hand in small batches right here in East Nashville, Tennessee, Moonshine Cowboy Boot Wax is the original, all-natural, non-toxic boot wax with a scent of orange. Moonshine Cowboy Boot Wax is a proprietary blend of American beeswax and other fine, all-natural ingredients. It's specially formulated to feed and protect your leather while also offering an excellent long-lasting shine. Whether it's your cowboy boots, your expensive wing tips, or your wife's favorite pumps, Moonshine Boot Wax is a must-have for gentlemen who care about their appearance. Moonshine Boot Wax is proud to partner with Community Food Advocates, a nonprofit organization working to end hunger by creating a healthy, just, and sustainable food system. Together with Community Food Advocates, Moonshine Cowboy Boot Wax is making a positive difference in the Nashville community, one shine at a time. You can buy your very own four ounce tin today by going to moonshinebootwax.com. And best of all, you can pay using Bitcoin. And because money is so fundamental, Bitcoin's a godsend in that way. So as soon as all those things came together, I was like, right, you know, I've just got to contribute to this movement. And the thing I can do is the thing I believe in, which is providing information. And then as a marketeer, that's about raising awareness. Marketing is about 
getting the things that people can benefit from in front of the people who can benefit from it. Yep. So I thought this is perfect, right? Those are the two things that came together. Um, and the final thing I'll say on that is you were talking about so meditation. How does that come into it? Well, the, all these incumbents who don't want to let go of the existing system, it's because they, they, they fear a sense of loss of some kind, mm -hmm. like especially on an individual level. If I'm a banker or politician, you know, I don't want to let go of control or power or whatever it is, or my income. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's based on the belief that things that you're going to be worse off with the new system. And I doubt if that's ever the case, because every time a system gets replaced, it gets replaced because the new version is an evolution of the previous one. Now, evolution moves in one direction, and it's more, it's towards more complexity in a greater balance, and it always moves in a positive upward direction. And that, again, is back to poor education. If, if the idea of evolution, not just on a biological level, but also like evolving yourself as a person, personality, you know, all that kind of thing, if that was sort of the fundamental pursuit and the purpose of the school system, if it was the basic belief system that we gave to our children that your your own personal growth, your own growing your own awareness and evolving as a person is is the primary reason or the thing that will get you the most out of life, they would approach life in a completely different way. Oh yeah. And you spoke about the what they teach in school, like this fact and that fact and the other fact. So they say this is why you need education. This is what you need to memorize. But one thing they don't teach is the is like how to think or how to go about finding information for yourself, yeah. how to go about solving your own problems. There's no, there's no toolkit, right? It's giving the answers versus training people how to find answers. And that keeps us in the same box as we always were. I think so. You know, it's sad to think that a person graduates from high school here in the United States and they can't do a couple of things that are really important. They cannot change a tire on a car, which is really important if you're out there driving and right. you're alone and you don't have anybody else around, you've got to be able to change that tire. They also don't teach people how to balance a checkbook. I know checks are old fashioned, but you know, the whole idea of balancing a checkbook or making sure that you are, you know, not in the red in your bank account. And then, you know, other things like when and why, should you get a loan or why should you not get a loan and what does that interest actually mm. mean when you're paying that interest back how long is it going to take you what are you actually paying and then you know what about when you get to the point where you maybe want to purchase a property or purchase some land at some point in your life we come out of high school really like babies who've been kept in these classes stay here and sit here and you know try to avoid goofing off because it's so boring and wait till the bell rings and then walk down the hall to the next room and go in there and stay there till the bell rings and then go to the next one and then eat lunch and then go to the next one and wait till the bell rings. You know, you have projects and papers to write and you get together with teams and you give presentations and maybe you work for the school newspaper or you're on a sports team or whatever, but you really, <laughs> you graduate from high school and yeah, you've learned how to read or write from, you know, starting in kindergarten and on through 12 12 grades but you really can't do anything you know <laughs> it's it's really right. it's really tragic i mean i know some schools are better than others but my public education growing up in indiana it's hard to even say that i learned anything it was so easy i'm relatively intelligent it was so easy for me i didn't have to study so i was the class clown in certain ways but you know i think a lot of kids when they graduated they struggle with what am I supposed to do next if they go to college? You know, sometimes you have that same repeat of the same thing. People graduate from college, don't know how to change a tire on a car, don't know how to buy a house, you know, and, and that was me too. When I went to four or well, five years of college, I came out, I had no idea how to buy a house. I was clueless. It was years later that I figured it out on my own. But yeah, it's really tragic in terms of what we're teaching and how we're just keeping students' minds small. Uh, and just not, you know, not letting them expand and not letting them learn about the things that you mentioned. It would be great if public education was teaching those things in terms of self-awareness and improving the self. Man, what a different world this would be. So much less violence for one thing, right? Right. So you leave college, you know, not really being able to do anything. Okay. So I've always questioned, even when I was doing exams and, and you know, the, the exams you do at school and university and so on. 
Well, what's the intention behind those, right? The intention is to test whether you've retained the information. And the belief behind that is, if you get a high grade on the exam, it must mean that you've sufficiently retained the information. But the misconception is that that means you're able to produce results in the world. Mm. That's where it falls to pieces, okay? So qualifications, I just don't buy it. I just don't buy qualifications at all. Just because you have a certificate or a piece of paper, that is not the same as being able to produce a certain result. We seem to confuse the two. Because you have a degree, it means it doesn't mean anything. It means you've got a degree. Mm -hmm. It means you've gone through the system, you've memorized stuff, and you've sat the exam. That is where it ends. Because a graduate and then someone who's self-taught, the self-taught person might be able to run rings around the graduate in terms of actually producing results in the world. That's why I don't believe qualifications are all they're cracked up to be. You know, the if if you go to someone and say, you know, I can produce this result, well, the best qualification is, is if you've if you can actually produce that result, okay? Yeah. That's all the qualification you need because that's the only reason we have the certificates in the first place is to kind of give people confidence so you can do something. Well, why not do it, right? Yeah. And then that's it. You don't need to bother with all the other stuff. Um, yeah. So changing the tire, you talked about that, okay? So you're stuck in the middle of nowhere and you've got a flat tire and because of a lack of education or a lack of awareness, you're in a tight spot, okay? Now, okay, consequences of that, what's the worst thing you might have to sleep in the car or because your cell phone battery is dead or whatever worst case scenario you go without a meal or two and then you sleep in the car it's fine okay not so bad but if something as simple as missing the information on how to change a tire gives you you know a night's worth of suffering and a rumbly stomach well that's quite a, an innocent bit of information what happens when you don't know how to manage money. Like you said, what happens when you don't know how to manage a household? What happens when you don't know how to maintain the finances and the economics around the roof over your head? Mm. The consequences of not having that information is dramatic yeah. by comparison. Yeah. And if we're not teaching how to change tires, well, you know, that is a real warning sign because it also means that we're not going to be teaching the other life skills, let's call them, um, because we don't, we don't value them. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty clear from our public education that we are churning out, that we want to churn out, um, you know, and states and federal governments decide on textbooks and they have these meetings and these people decide, okay, this is what we want the curriculum to be, it's how we want it to go. It's basically not that much different from when I was in school 30 years ago. It really has not, 35 years ago, it really has not changed that much at all. But I do think that the end goal is to produce somebody who graduates from high school, who can do very little, who is reliant upon the system, and who does not make waves, who basically is, you know, then charged with surviving in any way that you can. But what does that really mean? What does that translate to in the real world? That means you graduate from high school, and you go and you work, and you become a worker bee, and you produce. And if we, if we have worker bees that are producing, that's really all we need. We don't need thinkers. <laughs> you know, we don't need innovators. We just need worker bees to make those widgets and to do these things. And, you know, to think about that, that's what we're still churning out. And yet, you know, manufacturing in the United States, you know, an industry in the United States is really a joke compared to what it what it used to be or what I think it still could be if we'd done things differently. Um, yeah, it's just, man, this is just the United States. It's one big jolly joke, man. Yeah, I can't remember where I heard this, but it's the most eloquent way of putting what you just said in like one phrase. And it's, we're preparing our children for a world that no longer exists. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's heavy. You talk about worker bees, right? Now, in, in that very phrase is the is the idea that our physical labor is where the value is, almost as if work is a value in and of itself and that's why we still got the nine to five because it's almost like i'm gonna go back to the personal development stuff again it's almost as if our own sense of self-worth is tied to how much work we do rather than how much we actually produce hmm. so check that out that's the mental model we're using the amount i work is my worth right that's almost the belief hmm. what if it was 
what I produce is the most valuable. Well, that would then mean that it doesn't matter how many hours you worked. It would matter what you produced. If I worked one hour a week and I produced, say, you know, 10 pieces of software or five courses that actually transform people's lives, who's to tell me that an hour of work is too short? Yeah, I like it. So you also talked about like that. So that phrase I just mentioned, like we're preparing children for a world that no longer exists. Hmm. And uh, Peter Drucker, he said like in uh, one of his management philosophy books, he talks about, you know, 21st century, we're entering the age of the three C's, I think he called them, which is accelerated change, um, overwhelming competition and increasing complexity. Hmm. And of course, if you think about it, uh, it's like compound interest. The more complicated the world gets, the more complicated the world gets. So it's not just a, a, a linear line where complexity goes up one step at a time. It actually accelerates and it gets more complex every time. Yeah. A complex system gets more and more complicated every generation, right? Okay. Yeah. So that's why like the education system in particular, the friction in in the system and upgrading the curriculum is so slow that by the time they bring out a new curriculum, uh, it's completely out of date. It's completely irrelevant. And even if you mastered that curriculum, well, it's going to train you for a world that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. So the rate at which the education system evolves is slower than the pace of actu the actual real world. Same goes for the economic system. Same goes for the banking system. And because it's all this administration and all this friction is slowing down the evolution of the system because the group of people evolving it is so small. That brings us back to the free market. The free market is everybody who collectively uses their own energy to evolve their part of the system. And then as a collective, as a human collective, we'll, we'll work it out, right? We'll work it out. Yeah, absolutely, man. People can work it out. I am hugely optimistic that people can work it out moving forward. Of course, you know, obviously that does not mean that governments and banking cartels and all of that are going to lay down and die and let, you know, freedom run over them. They're going to continue to do whatever they feel is necessary to keep things the way that they have always done them. Um, but yeah, I love the idea that these new technologies with cryptocurrency um, are really starting to hack away at the low hanging fruit. Loans is a great example, you know, that now you have Kickstarter and the crowdfunding model, but what's coming is then a Kickstarter crowdfunding model that does not involve a third party that's a democratically autonomous corporation. The idea that there's an Uber that does not have a central authority. The idea that we can do this thing without that central authority is for me, probably the most exciting thing in the history of the world. Check this out as well. I'm not anti-government. I think that's unwise. To have, to have no government at all is not a good idea. So we need to shrink government, no doubt about it, but a small government is necessary. Yep. Because if you go completely down the other end of the scale and say, let's just go complete free free market economy okay so then every individual supply and demand and all that kind of thing and then the, you think that the economy will self-organize well it kind of will but what will happen over time is because again individuals they can only see to a certain horizon you won't think about the bigger issues like um maintaining the roads or something like that what will happen is certain parts of society's infrastructure will begin to degrade okay yeah. because in free market economics, each individual won't be thinking about the bigger picture. So you do need uh, some kind of government to take responsibility for that sort of level of planning. Yep. And of course, they need a certain amount of tax to fund that process. And uh, so if we do away with the government completely, that will be, I think, to our disadvantage and to our peril. So I'm not I'm, I'm not saying let's do away with government completely. Or we, what we, I think we are saying as a community is, Government's got way too big, way too complicated, way too, it's creating way too much friction in the system. Uh, it's got woven into the economic and the political system so much so that people don't know how it works, don't know who to vote for because it's too complicated. And even when we do vote for it, we don't get what we thought we'd get. Mm -hmm. There's no trust in the system and blah, 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 blah. So if we shrunk and simplified government so that it was actually a public service and people were who joined the government did so because they genuinely 
liked to serve the public. That's why we call them public servants. Mm -hmm. But I haven't seen many politicians like that lately, have you? No. You know, I have friends who are crypto anarchists, and I have friends who talk about having no government, getting rid of all government, and I think it's really ridiculous. The reason I think it's ridiculous is because it's never going to happen, period. Right. So I shouldn't say never. Maybe in 20,000 years, 50,000 years, everyone will be self-governed, however that would work. But, you know, in our lifetime, in the foreseeable future, we're going to have government. So really, it's a question. Do we have the same kind of government that we have with just like out of control bureaucracy, uh, corporate interests controlling what politicians think, this hierarchical structure that's like the new aristocracy where you have somebody's related to somebody else and then their buddy works for that regulatory body and then they're in Congress and then when they right. leave Congress, they consult for that company and then whatever. I mean, it's right. just ridiculous. It's just so out of control. But so for me, the question is not do we need government or not? Yeah, we're always going to have government and we do need some kind of government, you know, because we are human beings. But the question is, how can we now start to form it through peer-to-peer -peer action in such a way that it doesn't stay the way that it is for the next hundred years, that we make it smaller, we tighten it up, we make it transparent, we make voting transparent, we start to get these people to understand, like you said, they are public servants, they should be working for us, and they should be fearing us, and so therefore they do what's right. If they don't, then they're out because their reputation is sullied. You know, these days, it's, you know, quite the opposite. We fear the government and we're back to where we were. You know, if we were living in a hovel somewhere and, and the feudal lord's on the hill and he sends his tax gang down to take, you know, double your grain this year, which means that at least one of your family members will starve this coming winter and they rape your daughter, you know, and they burn your hut and you've got to survive winter's coming. I mean, that's what we're back to right now, fearing mm -hmm. that the feudal lord is going to send his henchmen down and destroy us. And it's all done, you know, in such a nice way. And it's always polite. And they're, you know, these guys who've graduated from law school that are called attorneys, and they're the ones that write up the contract. So it's got to be okay. It has to be right. It's legal and all of this. And, you know, these days I'm telling people, look, you talk about terrorism, T the terrorists are in Washington, D.C., and the terrorists are in London. The terrorists are in Paris and Brussels. The terrorists are in Washington, D.C., and they're wearing suits and ties, and most of them are white males. And that's here in the United States. You get to Mexico, it's the same thing. The terrorists are in the government. They're wearing suits and ties, and most of them are brown-skinned males. <laughs> you get to Africa, you know, and on and on. So in France, the terrorists are speaking French, wearing suits and ties, and most of them are white guys there in the government. So that's what we're dealing with. And moving forward, the question is, how can we strip some of these powers away from governments, not through violence, but through doing our own thing and concentrating our energies on economies that are fair, that are peer-to-peer, -peer, that are decentralized? What can we build uh, that is not fighting them within their system, but outside of their system? We build a system that works better than their system, and thereby we defeat them. Exactly. So we're going to go back to our two circles, the fiat circle and then the crypto circle, which has appeared and it's the way out that has never, the door has never been opened before. The door didn't go anywhere. So now there's a door. You may choose to walk through it into the crypto economy. Okay. Um, so similarly, that's a new system. And it's now inviting anyone who wishes, hey, stay in the fiat world if you want to. Stay in the existing government world if you want to. It's fine. Right. No one's forcing you to. That's the difference between the existing system and the new system. Everyone mm -hmm. in the crypto economy went there voluntarily now you can't say that about the existing system okay <laughs> because there's no alternative everyone stayed there now that's not by choice there was no choice so when roger veer calls himself a volunteerist you know the belief that society should be voluntary at every level that's exactly what crypto represents you know everything you join it voluntarily right yeah so you know it's people voting with their dollars Anyway, so back to government. Rather than bashing it, existing system doesn't work. Okay, fine. What's the solution? What what can we do to evolve this thing? Yeah. 
Well, government, the word government, it has the word govern in it. That's what the government's meant to do. It is meant to set certain rules, not necessarily laws, but sort of what sort of um, rules and ways of thinking govern that society. So there's a that's like a cultural thing, I guess, and government reflects the culture. Now in crypto, governance is a hot topic. How do you govern that economy? You know, governance of Bitcoin, how's that governed? Well, by the protocol, which is a set of rules which are in black and white, in code, in fact, which are irrefutable and transparent to everybody. And the very fact that you enter the Bitcoin economy means you automatically accept the laws of the land. And you yeah. can't break them, but the only way you can break them is by selling your Bitcoin and exiting. But it doesn't break the rules. It just means that you voluntarily decide to leave Bitcoin world because you don't like the government, okay? The government meaning the code base and the way that the code is set up, that's that's the government right there. Uh -huh. So you look at the government, you go, I like that rule, right? And you go elsewhere. So you maybe go over to BitShares or you look at the Dash protocol and you go, all right, that's got a different government, right? Government, you look at the rules, look at the governance model and you go, I like that one better. And then you move your money over there, okay? Voluntarily. Yeah. And as soon as the government sucks, you move, right? You move, uh -huh, yeah. frictionless, okay? So government is now in code, if you like. Um, I, I mentioned Dash in particular, because that's I've been studying that quite a bit, and it's got one of the better governance models. So this is this is the new, you have to completely redefine your idea of government. You know, what is government? It's a set of, is the thing, the body, the organization that sets the rules, uh, offers a set of rules, a system that you can then participate in. And once you enter, you know, you abide by the rules until you decide to leave. You know, and that's it, you know, and then this is why having 500 different cryptocurrencies is brilliant. Yes. Because they're all not just economic experiments. They're also experiments in government at the same time. Absolutely. I think Andreas Antonopoulos was right when he said that he sees a future where we have thousands, potentially thousands of cryptocurrencies. I agree with that. Right. And if not as a currency, as a, a governance model for some other way of living, you know, whether it's a voting system or it doesn't matter the whole the whole point of a blockchain is <clears throat> excuse me that it isn't um vulnerable to the whims of some human being depending on what mood they're in on that day yeah or if they have special interests who are knocking at their door saying hey look if you could vote the way that i want you to or if you could regulate the way that i want you to i'll give you this big sack of money yeah that they cannot be corrupted right so that's cool. And this is one of the challenges of being a human being is balancing the need as an individual with the need of the collective. Sometimes they're not compatible. And sometimes we make choices that, you know, get us what we want, but it might harm the collective. That would be something like throwing your Coke can on the streets, right? It's convenient for me. Mm -hmm. doesn't really help the world very much. Um, but then sometimes, you know, for our own decision making, we decide to sacrifice something that we want for the greater good and i'm not i'm not saying go one way or the other i think you need to balance the two i think though i used to live completely in self-sacrifice thinking that made me a good person it didn't it made me miserable but now i've rebalanced that to sort hmm. of have the wisdom to know when to honor myself and when it's time not to be selfish and when to be selfless and that is a big challenge that you know needs constant diligence but if we can balance it we each can get what we want and so can we all I like it. I think that's really an important balance to try to make in a person's life. And I would say just from listening to you talk, you definitely have a wisdom. How old are you? Do you mind me asking? Uh, I turned 33 on the 13th of March. Well, happy belated birthday. And yeah, 33, man. Ah, youth. I remember it well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, it sounds like in your 33 years, you've learned a lot and taught yourself a lot. And I like the fact that you're finding that balance right now. So let's try to wrap it up if we can. But I'd like to wrap it up by hearing about your course that you teach online, because I think that a lot of listeners are going to be interested in hearing about this. You know, this show, Bitcoins and Gravy, 
I have over 330,000 listens on SoundCloud. So it's got a pretty sizable group of people from over 100 countries that listen in each week. And of course, as it lives on SoundCloud, uh, theoretically in perpetuity forever, Mm -hmm. people come back and oftentimes they find my show and they listen to an episode they like, and then they go back and they listen to all of the episodes. So I have people that will send me an email saying, I loved your show. And it was episode 45, which was a long time ago. Right. And it's thrilling to me because it means that those interviews I had back then with those people and the ideas that they were presenting are living on. It's not just that that episode happened that week. People listen to it and never again. People continue to listen to these interviews and continue to learn, you know, who knows, a year from now, 10 years from now. So it's pretty exciting to think about this information. And of course, I'm not just referring to my podcast, any of the podcasts on the Let's Talk Bitcoin Network and any of the podcasts that are out there sharing valuable information with people. So tell us, if you would, about your course and what people could expect to learn by signing up for your course. You know, Give us a little layout of how the course works. Sure. So the title of the course is How to Confidently Join the New Digital Money Revolution. And the subtitle mm-hmm. is How to Master the Basics of Bitcoin and Own a Stake in the Future of Money because that's exactly what it will teach you to do. So it's um, seven hours of video content with my lovely face and my lovely voice, um, going through Mm -hmm. everything from the very basics of Bitcoin, uh, through the technology, through currency. We do a little uh, journey through, I do this little game where I assess three or four different uh, candidates for currency. We go through, is gold good money? And then we go through, all the aspects of what makes good money and sort of check them off to see if it qualifies or disqualifies. Then we look at paper, then we look at crypto. So we can all compare what different things have been used as money throughout the ages and how suitable they were and the pros and cons of that. Um, On the technology side of things, I think when it comes to money, people need to have confidence in in Bitcoin before they will put some of their hard-earned money into it. So while it's Mm -hmm. not absolutely necessary to understand the technology, um, I've put a module in there, which isn't doesn't go like into code or anything like that, but it does give sort of five or six lessons on how the technology side of things works, just so that with hmm. you know with that extra knowledge of say how the car engine works, if one day it won't start, you might go, oh, it's probably the spark plug. Whereas if you don't have that knowledge, you, you know you're not going to get to work that day. So similarly, the reason I teach a bit of technology is so that if you come across a little obstacle on your Bitcoin journey. If you understand that little bit of technical know-how, you'll be able to identify what the problem is and avoid any traps or whatever. Hmm. I then have five or six lessons on looking at the current system, how it's structured and why I think it's broken. So you can see sort of the angst that Satoshi Nakamoto was probably under when he decided that there needed to be a better way. Um, Mm -hmm. There's there's actually a little um, video in that module. It's called How Banks Can Legally Steal Your Money. Now that's not slanderous. This is actually in law in the United Kingdom and America. Uh, I think it was the UK that started this in the House of Lords about, I think it was about a hundred years ago where they they wrote into law and you can check this in the UK law and the American uh, law archives, that basically when you deposit money in a bank, legally what you're doing is you're lending it to them. Mm -hmm. So you're you're transferring ownership of that money to them. And what you get in return is the right, and it's only the right to demand repayment of that money when you want it. Hmm. What that means is then the bank can basically do what he wants with it. Because if he gambles on the stock market or loses it, he hasn't defrauded you because in law, it's his money until you demand repayment. Now, of course, if you go to the bank and demand payment and he says no, then he's broken the law and now you can sue him. But the chances are by the time you you go and want to demand your money back, say if there was a bank run, well, the chances are the reason the bank run is because the bank might be failing. Maybe it bet on the stock market, lost loads of money, and they might be refusing mm. to give you your money back because it's not there, right? Um, yeah. So yeah. then then basically your relationship with the bank at that point is just like um, a company that's going bust who owes you money. Well, then you just get in the queue yeah. for the creditors. And because you're an unsecured creditor, you know, the bank didn't give me any collateral when I deposited my money in the bank. That means you're probably the last on the list to get paid, which is yeah. means you're probably going to get pennies on the dollar. Now, this isn't that's not a conspiracy. This is fact. And when you look at that lecture, 
it's based on an essay that this research company wrote a little while ago and I actually link back to the original research company and the original essay that they wrote on this which identifies exactly what the laws are so to me that made me feel sick when i read that yeah and i thought i've got to include that in the course once you've done the theory side of things then the rest of it's all practical like how to get yourself a bitcoin wallet what's the you always use a desktop wallet a web wallet hardware wallet whatever and each section's got a little quiz to make sure you've you know you've um, you're learning the lessons mm -hmm. we talk about what role do you want to play in the bitcoin economy do you want to be a user do you want to be a full node Do you want to be a miner do you want to be a developer what all that means and you know what are the benefits of doing each and then finally we go into how do you get some bitcoin for yourself and then how do you spend it and then go on to sort of conclusions and what you can do next wow i like it man that sounds like a great course now this course is available right now online is that right that's correct and tell our listeners how they can find this course what's the easiest way to find it uh, the easiest way to find it is if you go to digitalmoneyrevolution.com you'll see the page there that will tell you the story of where the course came from and so on they will talk to you about the banks and the governments and then you'll be able to get it from there digitalmoneyrevolution.com that's correct i love it and now should we talk at all about the cost of the course here or should we let listeners go there and figure that out for themselves yeah because it's listed in pounds um it will it'll just automatically convert it at the checkout but i don't know depends what when you go and what the conversion rate is from pounds to dollars i see but if you get to the checkout and you put the uh coupon code bitcoins and gravy in it'll give you a nice discount on it oh yeah that's right we were gonna do that that's great okay so put the coupon code bitcoins and gravy all one word that's right and that'll get you a discount on the course and this course is ongoing and i assume that you are adding to it on a regular basis over time yeah absolutely this is the first one this is the foundational knowledge and then once you've got that there's well the sky's the limit there's all kinds of other things you can do with bitcoin that you know the sky is the limit on that yeah man and there's so much excitement going on in the bitcoin world right now and in the world of cryptocurrency it's really incredible just what ethereum is doing in bit shares and dash and you know <laughs> it's really just amazing what's going on and you know whether you're an investor just looking to make a little bit of extra money this is a great time to get involved in cryptocurrencies and if you're a coder if you're into tech and you uh, want to get involved uh, I would suggest definitely take Chris's course and that will kind of get you steered in the right direction to utilize your tech skills and apply those skills towards something that could work in the bit sphere I'm excited about your course listeners if you want to learn more about Bitcoin and you feel like it's not you know your cup of tea to sit online reading article after article after article i have every confidence that chris coney's course is going to lead you in the right direction he's a man who obviously knows what he's talking about and who also has a high moral standard which is what we need these days probably more than anything chris thank you so much for taking time to be on the show listeners you've been listening to the marketing monk chris coney chris thank you so much well, thank you very much for having me, John. It's been an absolute pleasure. It has indeed. And hey, if you ever make it Nashville way, feel free to stop by. We'll head out and have some uh, Nashville barbecue and a couple pints of beer or something like that. Oh, don't tease me. <laughs> I know that does sound good. Hey, you're always welcome here, though, man, for real. Oh, if I'm anywhere within 100 miles, I will be at your house. That sounds great, man. Well, hey, take care, and hopefully I'll talk to you sometime soon. Thanks, mate. I'll talk to you soon. All right, bye. Bye-bye. I'd like to thank my guest on today's show, the marketing monk, Chris Coney. Listeners, make sure to check out Chris's course by going to digitalmoneyrevolution.com. Once you're there, you can use the coupon code Bitcoins and Gravy for a healthy discount on this great course. Do you want to learn about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies without sifting through hundreds of websites and reading for hundreds of hours? Then go to digitalmoneyrevolution.com and sign up for the course. You'll be glad you did.
And a special thanks to our sponsor, Moonshine Cowboy Boot Wax, the original all-natural non-toxic boot wax with a scent of orange. The Nashville Wax Company is now offering Moonshine Biker Boot Wax. Yes, the same high-quality boot wax now available in black. And their newest product is Moonshine Miracle Residue Remover for removing stubborn, sticky stuff. It's like Goo Gone, but without the toxic petroleum-based chemicals. Folks, I've tried this, and it works like a charm. Talk about a household helper. All Moonshine products are 100% natural and are available at 15 different fine retail outlets in the Nashville area, including the shops at the Nashville airport. To order a tin of Moonshine Boot Wax or a four-ounce bottle of Moonshine Miracle Residue Remover, stay where you are. That's right, without even getting up out of your chair, just go to moonshinebootwax.com. Use your credit card, your debit card, or better yet, pay the modern way with Bitcoin. That's right, Bitcoin, the modern way to pay at moonshinebootwax.com. And I'd like to thank our sponsor, CryptoCompare.com, the absolute best resource on the internet for discovering new, up-to-date information on the exciting and ever-changing world of cryptocurrencies. CryptoCompare.com, the best resource for cryptocurrency traders and investors. That's CryptoCompare.com. And a shout out to the Bitcoins and Gravy freelance transcriptionist for his excellent and highly accurate work. Professional transcriptions of the show can be found on our website. And to get in touch with the freelance transcriptionist, just head over to his website. That's diaryofafreelancetranscriptionist.com. And finally, I'd like to thank my loyal listeners, that's you, for tuning in and for giving me such great feedback about the show. Your comments in the show notes are always appreciated, as are the tips that you send to my Bitcoin wallet. Listen, guys, I'm a hardworking guy with two jobs and without a lot of money, so every little bit counts. Even a 50-cent tip sent to my wallet goes a long way to making me feel that doing this job on a volunteer basis is worth it. It also helps keep the lights on and coffee in the kettle. Signing off now from Nashville, Tennessee, the Bitcoin center of the South, I'm John Barrett, the host of Bitcoins and Gravy, here each week with my trusty dog, Maxwell, right by my side. Say goodbye, Maxwell. <laughs> Until next week, friends, remember that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men and women to do nothing. Do something, y'all, and be proud of it. I know that it may sound absurd, but I have for you a magic word, and today the magic word is digital. D-I-G-I-T-A-L. Digital. As in the sentence, to learn everything you need to know about Bitcoin and the exciting world of cryptocurrencies, head over to digitalmoneyrevolution.com and check out Chris Coney's great course. And remember, the coupon code to use for your discount is Bitcoins and Gravy. That's right. Use the coupon code Bitcoins and Gravy when you go to digitalmoneyrevolution.com. Calm. Now climb aboard, y'all. This train is bound for glory. And there's plenty of room for all. Well, Satoshi Nakamoto, that's a name I love to say. And we don't know much about him, but he came to save the day. When he wrote about the way things are and the way things are to be, he gave us all a protocol this world had never seen. A Bitcoin, as you're going into the old blockchain. A Bitcoin, I know you're going to rain, going to rain. Till everybody knows, everybody knows, till everybody knows your name. told about the death of old Mount Gox, about traders trading altar coins and miners mining blocks. But them good old boys back in Illinois and on down through Tennessee, see they don't care to be a millionaire, they're just wanting to be free. A Bitcoin as you're going into the old blockchain. A Bitcoin, I know you're going to rain, going to rain, till everybody knows, everybody knows, till everybody knows your name. of Parliament.
government While the bankers count our money out for every government Oh, Bitcoin flies on through the skies of virtuality A promise to deliver us from age-old tyranny Oh, Bitcoin, as you're going into the old blockchain Oh, Bitcoin, I know you're going to rain, going to rain Till everybody knows, everybody knows, till everybody knows your name Till everybody knows, everybody knows, till everybody knows your Give me some exposure Everybody knows your name, sing it Oh, Lord, pass me some more Oh, Lord, before I have to go Oh, Lord, pass me some more Here's the thing, I want to shift the conversation slightly because I think it's wrong to think about cryptocurrencies displacing fiat or measuring cryptocurrencies against the fiat they displace. Okay. That I think is not the right way to look at it. Any more than we would look at the internet and say, well, how many phone lines and fax machines has the internet displaced? Well, it hasn't really displaced them. What it did was it rendered the entire paradigm obsolete and made the very measurement of internet in terms of phone lines and fax ludicrous and irrelevant. And so the question is, when do we start measuring Bitcoin, not in terms of it being worth $450, but in terms of one Bitcoin being worth one Bitcoin, and in terms of Bitcoin not displacing economic activity in fiat, but essentially enabling completely new models of economic activity that have nothing to do with the old paradigm and cannot even be measured in terms of the old paradigm. We're currently measuring cryptocurrencies in terms of the old paradigm because that's the context we have. And and that's a bit like saying that the total value of the internet is the number of the users times how much they're paying for their DSL and cable modem connections, or how many bricks and mortar stores it's replaced. And again, that's completely missing the point. It enables entirely new ways of communicating. Well, Bitcoin enables entirely new ways of economic transactions and economic activity. So, from that perspective, I think it's wrong to look at whether a nation or a significant percentage of population have a adopted Bitcoin. Let's look more at the possibility of having the first transnational community of economic activity on the internet that is independent of nation states and that exhibits elements of sovereignty through financial purchasing power on its own without the use of a sovereign currency. Uh, so that is far more interesting to me because it completely renders the old paradigm irrelevant and makes it unnecessary to measure ourselves by those metrics. I think one of the key things we're going to see is Bitcoin affecting some of the core capabilities within the internet. For example, monetizing and rewarding the creation of content, as well as building and paying for infrastructure for internet connectivity by making that infrastructure productive in terms of economic activity, because it now carries a currency over it. The other big milestones for me are the ability to disrupt the remittances market, enabling the transnational flows of currency from migrant workers to their home countries and families, which can have a very, very significant and immediate impact on poverty around the world, because that's one of the most exploitative markets in financial services. And the third one is enabling um, essentially uh, cryptocurrency IPOs, where companies anywhere in the world can make public offerings of crypto stocks available to investors anywhere in the world without any barriers to entry and creating completely new economic activity by allowing for direct investment. So, 